Here's something quite a bit different from the sorts of things I usually show. This is a Hervic solid state stereo receiver, model HR150. It dates to around 1973 or 1974. Some of you can maybe guess before I even turn it on what might have drawn me to this thing. And there it is. The Nixie tube display for the frequency. Now this receiver doesn't actually have digital tuning. What it has is an analog tuner that feeds a frequency counter to display the frequency you have the thing set to. Those Nixie tubes are just beautiful. Now when I got this thing, two of the Nixie tubes were out and the display was not changing when the dial was turned, but it was changing stations. And these uh, lights here for the meter were out as well. Now unfortunately the tuning meter doesn't seem to be working. That may be a mechanical problem, I'm not sure. You also see that the stereo indicator light isn't really doing its job. Like right now it's set to 991 and that's a real station. All you can do is hope the right person comes along, which is and why it's coming in nice and clear. Recruiter for free at ziprecruiter.com/uncanny. The stereo light seems to mostly flick around between stations. Unfortunately, I don't have any kind of service manual for this thing. There was just some partial blurry schematics online, which isn't really super helpful. You're probably wondering why I'm not showing this thing off with speakers. The thing is, I don't really have any suitable speakers to hook up to this thing. Probably shouldn't have even bought this receiver, but I did. And uh, luckily I was able to get the main attraction of it working pretty quickly. Besides the FM only tuner, you also have the option for a phono input and two auxiliary inputs. Now you'll notice that the Nixie tube display does not go off and you can even uh, change stations while well, you've got it set to something else. That's how it's supposed to work, apparently, from some period reviews of this thing I read. That is a bit confusing, because from a distance you can't even see what you've got it set to, and you may be wondering why it's you know not playing the radio. There's no indicator lights or anything to show you what you have selected. And it could save life on the Nixie tubes by you know blanking them when you're not on FM. It's got a uh, low filter and a high filter, which seem to work pretty well. There's the uh, tape monitor, you can switch on there, you can switch on and off the FM uh, muting between stations. See with the mute defeat there's static and with it switched back to the normal position, static's a lot quieter. These kind of sliding controls were pretty popular in the 1970s. They can often be pretty finicky, but these ones seem to be working well. And they've got a nice detent right in the, uh, the middle of the range there. Now this is actually a fairly high power receiver um, for the time. I believe it's 75 watts per channel. I'll have to double check that. And you'd need some fairly significant speakers to really take advantage of this thing. You can have two sets of speakers hooked up. I don't have any speakers hooked up, so I'm not going to push either of those switches. It also takes a while for these to dim down. That's because I replaced the burned out incandescent bulbs with LEDs. For a receiver that cost, if I'm remembering correctly, $875 back in 1973, it is a little strange that they didn't put bulb holders in for the dial light bulbs. Seems like an odd thing to cut costs on. But in any case, they were soldered in and uh, two of them had already been crudely replaced so I just put LEDs in there 
with a bypass resistor to bleed down the capacitor quicker. These things were staying lit for minutes originally. And that was a little much. Alright, I'm going to unplug it and take the cover off. I already took the screws off of this thing, so all I have to do is lift this cover off. So there's the insides. There's quite a bit of stuff in here. It's not jam-packed, but there's quite a bit of stuff in here. Now this board up top here is the frequency counter board. You see it's got a crystal there. And then uh, just 7400 series logic chips, with the exception of this one chip here. This uh, Motorola MC853P. Now, the issues with the frequency counter board were due to two bad chips. One of the Nixie tube driver chips was bad, and I put a replacement uh, 74141 in there. There's one of the original chips there. It's a uh, 7441. Just an earlier version of the 74141. It doesn't handle invalid inputs, but otherwise the pinout is the same. The red wire there goes to the high voltage filter cap there, and there's no bleed down resistor on it, so that is live right now. Definitely have to watch your fingers. Over here is, I believe, the preamp for one of the inputs. This thing has definitely seen some repairs in the past. I've noticed a few transistors look like replacements, just because they don't match. You notice this one here is different than the other three. It looks like one of the driver transistors here has been replaced. This all looks untouched though. These are the you know, power output transistors. You see there's eight of them in there. But yeah, this thing has definitely been serviced before. It still has all its original filter capacitors. It seems like they're all good because they were able to hold voltage when the thing was switched off. It does push these caps fairly hard though. They rated 65 volts max and it pushes them to like 58 volts. So, leaving like 7 volts of margin there. Not a lot. It's one hefty transformer there. And I was picking up all those stations with just a clip lead attached to the FM antenna input, so the sensitivity on this thing is pretty great. Alright, I'm going to turn it around and show you guys the back. Alright, so you can see all the inputs now. You've got your phono, aux 1, aux 2, tape in, and your tape out. And then here are your connectors for your main speakers, and your remote speakers, and your FM antenna. I just had a clip lead go into the 300 ohm connection there. These are pretty rare. I haven't personally ever seen another one, but I also haven't really been looking for them. I just happened to find this one. So there's a the serial number there, 1134. It's 120 volts AC only, and 50 to 500 watts. With no speakers attached, just playing through headphones, it was drawing about 27 watts. And here's the uh, you know, switched outlets for hooking up other stuff to it, like a turntable or something. This resistor here is not original. I added that just to help bleed down this capacitor. The arrangement they use is that this capacitor here just has two wires across it essentially. This uh, green striped and blue striped one, and those go to the, the dial lights. And you can see the eh, less than perfect job I did there replacing it with LEDs, but that's uh, sturdy enough I'd say. It's not going to come loose. This other capacitor here, besides being used by the you know output stage, is also connected to the frequency counter here. So this capacitor bleeds down pretty quick. Those 7400 series parts are pretty thirsty. On the side of the metal cover here it says Hervic Electronics Inc. Los Angeles, California, USA, HR150 solid state stereo receiver. And then the usual warning about not getting in there yourself, but I already did that. I now also have the original owner's manual for the Hervic HR150. The person I bought the receiver from forgot to send it with the receiver. And they mailed it separately a couple days later. I'll just go through it real quick. You can pause the video if you want to see the text in more detail. Unfortunately, the one thing I was hoping would be in here is not, and that's a schematic. 
I haven't been able to find any service information for this thing. There probably was a service manual made, but if so, I have not seen one. Most of the features of this thing are pretty self-explanatory. There's all the specs for this thing. And there's the back cover. Tucked in the manual was some receipts from a past servicing of this unit. For all the work that was done, that price seems pretty low. Just $40. Perhaps the owner was a friend of the person doing the service. This would have been pretty snazzy in 1995, I would think. Computerized testing of your amplifier. Lastly, before I bring this video to a close, I also have the original optional wooden cabinet. It's pretty nicely made. Looks like veneered, uh, well, veneered particle board. That's what they were mainly using back then, but it looks nice on the outside. It's got a you know, perforated metal plate for ventilation, like you see on some Fisher receivers. If it ever came with screws to hold the thing in place and rubber feet, it's missing them now, unfortunately. Might have to find a replacement for that. Some of these wood cases were just kind of loose around the receivers, though. Well, thanks for watching.